everybody. Can you hear me okay? Um, I'm John Affleck. Uh, I'm the uh, Night Chair in Sports Journalism and Society at Penn State and the Director of the Curley Center, and I'd like to welcome you all to this Curley Center conversation with Penn State alum, uh, Jim um, uh, Myself and my teaching assistant, Rafael Lapontes, are going to uh, lead a Q&A with Jim over the next uh, hour or so, but it is very much, I know professors always get up here and go, well, I want this to be interactive. We actually need it. Um, so we're going to just like any time anybody has a question, just raise your hand, we'll call on you. You can ask anything we want to very, we've had a couple of uh, meetings with student groups today that were really nice and free-flowing and, um, you know, just people <coughs> ask what they, what they wanted to know. So, uh, so that's, so that's the deal. Um, the reason, um, Jim is here is not just because he's got a, a degree that says Penn State on it. Um, he's also um, he also worked at the Center Daily Times and was sworn at by Joe Paterno. Yes. Um, My proudest moment. And uh, we, uh, we may get into that for a little bit. But um, uh, Jim's uh, an, uh, an editor in the news department at the LA Times. And he's the uh, co-founder of Outsports, which is uh, probably the leading, kind of has almost a statesman-like position at this point, uh, a website dedicated to LGBTQ uh, athletics and sports. And so uh, our Sports Media and Society uh, uh, class in particular that examines all manner of uh, culture and sports uh, intermixing, uh, we really wanted to talk to Jim today. Um, so, with that introduction, I think we'll just get down to it. So, I'm going to assume that most, that many people in this room have not looked at Outsports, or if they have, um, it's just been in the past week as this was coming up. So, uh, I'm wondering if you can tell us about this place, what it does, whatever you want to, whatever you want to say. Well, first, what the, do I turn this on? I just want to thank John and Rafa and Penn State for having me back. I lived in Hamilton Hall for two years um, with my boyfriend, which was really cool because uh, straight guys couldn't live with their girlfriends on campus, but all the straight guys were mad that the two gay guys got to live together in the same room. So it was kind of a, a weird perk of being gay back in the late 70s of like nobody was paying attention to that as a possibility. So. Had a great time there and graduated from Penn State and went to the Center Daily Times for five years as a political editor, assistant editor. I was a part time food editor, which is bizarre. I don't know how I got that job. Um, and then uh, moved to California and been with the LA Times since 1999, which is the same year I found at Outsports. So I want to thank you all for having me back. It's funny to sell these Penn State shirts because in LA, You'll see a Penn State, oh, it's Penn State, it's rare here, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm on Penn State, I'll have to ask these people if they, they go to Penn State or not, so. So tell us about the founding. Uh, I would say it started like most good ideas do, with a vacation on Cape Cod. One of my best friends, uh, Sid Ziegler, we played in the Gay Flight Football League together. I started the Gay Flight Football League in Los Angeles, and we're raising money at, and trying to get interest at the local Pride Fair in L.A., and he came up to the booth and started playing flag football. Turned out he was a huge NFL fan. I had the NFL Sunday ticket, which was a direct TV thing, one of the few people back in the 90s that had it. So he'd come up to my house every week and watch football. We were just geeking out over the NFL. And I went to vacation together, and he said, there's a thing called the Internet. Maybe we should start a website for gay people who like sports. And we discovered a group on Yahoo of Philadelphia-based gay guys who love talking about sports. So we joined their group and started this website, which is like one page on the do-it-yourself website maker, which look, you, I think the Wayback Machine still has it hideous looking, but our first page went up in November of 1999 talking about the NFL. And then for some reason, Yahoo, the, Yahoo was a big website back then. Like was, there was no Google, no Facebook, no TikTok, no nothing. And they named us Cool Site of the Day two days in. I don't know how they found out about us, and our traffic started growing. and. We started hearing from people who were, at the time, there was not much discussion of T or Q. It was more of the L, the G, and the B. 
talking about, hey, I'm a sports fan too, or I'm an athlete, and we just start writing about it because we cared about it and we thought nobody else was writing about this subject, even the gay media was just ignoring it or clueless about it. And the fact that we're both sports fans, we could talk the talk, and we both we both played recreational fag football. <laughs> that is a slip of the tongue. Played <laughs> football for, for about 20 years, and um, so we kind of knew knew the, the, the locker room culture. So uh, the website's kind of grown from then. We 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 specialize in coming out stories. We've told hundreds of coming out stories of athletes and all sorts of sports, athletes, coaches, referees, media people. I'm doing our first pickleball player on Wednesday, who's uh, telling his coming out story. Um, and we also do just a lot of news. We just write about anything that has to do with the intersexual, inter intersection of sexuality in sports. In the early days, there were so few people were out. Uh, there was one time when uh, people may have heard of Mike Piazza, the former Mets and Dodgers uh, catcher. There was a rumor in the New York Post with a blind eye who didn't name Mike by name, but everyone knew who it was. He was buying a house with his boyfriend, uh, Sam Champion, who was a weatherman. And Piazza, held a press conference to announce he was to announce he was a heterosexual, which is a was kind of a bizarre thing to do. And we covered the hell out of that and we got mainstream media attention for that and that kind of just started, kind of just blossomed and we've kind of been writing about this whole issue for the last twenty four years. And it seemed that you seem to think you run out of content. There's never you never run out of content. Um, what's uh, what's news these days? What's uh, what's what's going on on, on the website? Kind of in a bad way, politics has really interfered now. It's, it's entered the sports world. I mean, there are more, as you saw, there was a 410 anti-LGBTQ bills proposed in various states in the U.S. so far this April, which is a record. And so that's caused the whole issue of LGBTQ rights to be debated in a way that I thought we had kind of settled that with gay marriage. Like, you know, um, people are calling us groomers again and pedophiles, words that have been... I think they're 40 years old, like no one used that, but they're being used now. And we're seeing it sort of infect sports. Uh, the whole transgender athletic participation is a big story. There are bills being passed in all sorts of, 20 states now I think prohibit uh, trans uh, girls from competing in, uh, on, on uh, 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 girl sports. Uh, the Supreme Court issued a, not really a ruling, but they allowed a 12 year old trans girl to keep running in West Virginia while that case is being held. International sports bodies all have rules over trans participation and inclusion. And even in the NHL, the weirdest thing is that the NHL has been having pride nights for the last five, six years, very kind of so innocuous that we stopped covering them. They were just like, okay, it's the Flyers pride night, it's the Penguins pride night, or whatever. And one of the traditions has been most teams, but not all, would wear a warm up jersey with, you know, they'd have a local artist design something with a rainbow or something really colorful that said pride, and the players would skate around with the pregame skate for about 15 minutes, and that was that. And it was a, a non-issue until January when a member of the Flyers refused to wear his pride jersey, citing his religious beliefs. And that became the story, not the pride night, not everything else but pride night. And then the next week, the Rangers decided not to wear their pride jerseys because a couple of players complained about them. So that became the story, and then the Minnesota Wild did the same thing and blamed Russia's anti-gay laws, because in Russia, if you are seen to be promoting homosexuality, however that loosely is defined, you could possibly go to jail. And the fear of some Russian players allegedly was that if they wore the pride jersey, they'd be promoting homosexuality, therefore they or their families would be at risk back in Russia. Well, the weird thing is the NHL said they have not had a single evidence that this is an issue with Russia, and there have been several Russian players that have worn the pride jersey anyway, so it's like, the story, then people are doing stories on this, like are these guys really anti-gay or are they more afraid of, of the, uh, the Russian laws? So it's weird that something like Pride Night, which is literally innocuous, are now a hot button issue in the NHL. And so it's an example of the kind of stuff I never thought I'd be covering. Mm -hmm. And that's happening more and more. I think we get into an election year where we have more and more of that because there's so much debate going on state by state over participation of LGBTQ people in life what you can teach, what you can say, and with, with trans athletes. We still do a lot of coming out stories and <laughs> celebrations of people in sports. I and mean, when Carl Nassib came out, that was obviously fantastic. And we had the first we had the first actual story up on that. We didn't have the first, yeah, it was, was kind of a little thing. I wrote that thing and I zipped through it in five minutes and got it up and 
So that, that was a highlight just to get that at the, out in front of everybody first. I, I'm, I'm just going to ask one quick follow-up and then give Rob a shot. Um, the, um, it just comes to mind now uh, with you mentioning flag football and uh, previously in, a, in Zoom times we had Jim on in class and in his living room he had a trophy which is about the size of a Lombardi trophy. It's it is a Lombardi trophy. I, got, I, I was inducted into the National Gay and Lesbian Hall of Fame. I <laughs> not remember. We started this third name called the Gay Bowl that started third, three teams and now had like 50. Awesome. So, awesome. And I won it twice, by the way. One as a coach, one as a quarterback. <laughs> only, probably the only person. And I have two gay games gold medals as a quarterback, so take that, Tom Brady. You know. <laughs> um, so here's, here's the question. At the same time as this is going on, this gets a little bit into the sort of greater landscape over time. And I don't want to go too deep, but uh, we were at the Super Bowl this year. Uh, well, we, had a, we had a team of people, and I noticed in a way that I hadn't noticed before the NFL doing like the NFL did like uh, 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 like football game yeah and uh, a couple other things um, and I know uh, in years past the NFL has kind of quietly given uh, some support to the annual conference that we run yeah um, can you can you just talk about that like the general tone from the leagues from the big leagues? well the big leagues are all on a on a on a, a, a Front office level, they're fantastic. They all have diversity, equity, inclusion <coughs> policies. Uh, Roger Goodell has a gay brother. Uh, there's a ton of gay people who work openly in the NFL on all sorts of things. So, and like the gay, the gay flag football is now such a big deal that the Broncos sponsor the team, a team, you know, team in Denver, the Seahawks in Seattle. It's, it becomes so innocuous in a good way because they realize that like, they have a fan base of LGBTQ people. And they want to keep that fan base and grow it. So it's actually been one of the positive things coming out is if a gay player came out, they would have 100% support from any sports league in the country. No one would imagine if Carl Nassib came out and Roger Goodell said he should come back at a club like that's not going to happen. Right. And so in a good way, a player coming out is no longer controversial. It's celebrated, and it should be. We still need more of them to do it. There's a million reasons we can talk about that why they don't, but. A player coming out is not going to face any backlash from the institution itself that's going to support it. Because they all have one, all the um, player union contracts have sexual orientation as a protected class. So in a sense, they really have, they're, they're, they're doing good with that. But obviously, we still need more people to come out. OK, so you mentioned now that there is a million reasons why they don't come out. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And also the gender difference between for female athletes to come out and male athletes to come out? Uh, well, first on the why, I mean, some of the traditional ones, I don't want to stand out. I'm afraid of fans, my teammates, <clears throat> sponsors. A lot of that's been dismissed. But I think the biggest reason is, I may ask everybody, who in here is identifies as, say, heterosexual? Raise your hand. How many of you came out to your parents as heterosexual? <laughs> and I think that's the issue is that gay people have to come out somebody and they have to come out to everybody it's like a long going it's an ongoing process and so a lot of players we've talked to privately just don't want the idea of having to talk about their sexuality in public maybe a million times and so I think the coming out process is one weird way that kind of keeps people from saying I don't really want to do this publicly now there are I'll get to the women in a second but there are men who are out in pro sports with their teammates and their coaches maybe a couple teammates and stuff. so not like they're all hidden but to do a public sort of Carl Nassif, I'm gay, just gets so much media attention. I think people just kind of rather not deal with it. Um, I think that's a big issue. I think the fans no longer care. I mean, the joke was that Aaron Rodgers we used to live with his boyfriend. I have no idea if that's true or not. But him and his, his uh, roommate broke up. So they broke up. Aaron started playing bad. And so fans were going, I wish he'd get back with his boyfriend because he was a better quarterback. Now, of course, which tells me that they don't care. They don't, if you're an Eagles fan, you don't care if Jalen Hurts' sexuality. You just care if Jalen Hurts is, you know, wins games for you. And the Aaron Rodgers thing was no one knew if he was gay or not, but the joke was if he was, he'd be better off going back with his boyfriend because he was a better player. So fans aren't going to care. Coaches, I don't think they're going to care. I think a lot of owners, unfortunately, there's still some old school owners that probably would be uncomfortable maybe having an openly gay player. 
But I think you're seeing as management gets younger and younger, they just don't care. The Phoenix Suns number two basketball operations guy is openly gay guy. He's 29 years old. And, you know, he's, he's on the basketball side. He's not on the business side. Um, so now we get to the women. And the best illustration is that there were 186 openly gay LGBTQ athletes at the Tokyo Olympics. Um, 150, I believe, were women, 35 were men. And the 35 men was like an enormous number. But women simply have a, it's perceived to be a safer space for women to come out in sports than it is for a man to come out. They can be themselves, they can be, there's a lot more women around that we even know about because it's so routine that, you know, I asked you uh, how many women on the Brazilian national soccer team are gay, and you said all of them, like, you know. Um, we did a uh, story, there were 70 out coaches at the, uh, in the, during the women's uh, NCAA tournament this year, both assistant and head coach. And we found that out by literally doing a Google search, having a women's basketball wife, coach wife, and we discovered this stuff on websites, which never used to happen. It'd be like their profile on their <coughs> official school thing, she is married to her wife, blah, blah, and they have two kids. You don't see that with men. So women have a, a, have a safer, in many ways, a safer route to coming out. Now there's of course a lot of problems women have with sports on you know uh, visibility, uh, unequal pay, but on the sexuality issue, it's probably easier for women to be out than it is for men. When Brittany Griner came out, that was a blip on the screen. When Jason Collins came out, at the same time, it was a huge story, and Brittany Griner was like up here as far as being a superstar, and Jason Collins was a journeyman like down here, and yet his story got a million times attention than Brittany Geiger did when she came out. So I think there's this, there's just this weird assumption that, yeah, yeah, women can be gay and nobody cares about it. Um, so, but we're, and it's still existing because there's a lot, there's one openly gay men's basketball coach in the entire country. And there's 70 women at least, and maybe more than that. Questions from the audience? Anybody got something? Fish. Um, seeing the, uh, landscape of society with like social media like being more apparent, especially like in 2020 when COVID happened and the Black Lives Matter movement happened and now we're <coughs> more aware of society and culture. Where do you see the whole age of like the LGBTQ community like in sports? Like when can you, when do you see like the future of it, let's say it's like five years from now, ten years from now? I'm sorry, I, I, do you think I love it? Yeah, I'll say like what's what vision do you see with the LGBTQ community in sports in like five to ten years now that we've seen that people? Well, I think younger people simply, generally, are very supportive or just don't care. It's just not a big deal with young people I know. Like their friends don't, they're supportive, but they're not like bothered by someone who identifies that way. A lot more people are identifying as non-binary than ever before, and that's something that five years ago you hardly ever heard. And I think social media is a big driver because people can be themselves on social media. I know a pro beach volleyball player who's openly gay on TikTok, and he does a lot of just volleyball TikToks, and I mentioned occasionally do TikToks about being gay, and he's developed a huge following just because he's himself. So I, I, I would hope social media, and you see influencers like, you know, stars in the NFL when NASA came out, it was big that a lot of the big names came out and said, wow, this is fantastic, you know, more power to you. And so I, I do think that social media is actually, it's bad for society in a lot of ways, but I think for a lot of LGBTQ people, it's a, life, it's a lifeline because you can feel really isolated in some parts of this country, but through social media, you can meet people all over the place and feel that you're not alone. Sorry, I turned off my, uh, can you guys hear me? Is that, okay, okay. So uh, you mentioned, coming back to something you said before about how uh, sports and politics are bleeding together more than ever. What, uh, what do you think is the role of sports journalists in covering these things? Like, what have you noticed on how they cover it, and what do you think we can do better? Well, I think sports. Related to well, I just think in general, sports journalists have to realize that these athletes have lives outside of sports, and they have interests, and they have families, and I think they sh people should do a better job of covering that aspect. I mean, I think that. With the abortion issue, like that is a huge story for female athletes, and I think more right people should write about that, write about what they think about it. Like I'm curious that we're having we're having this bifurcated nature where you have some states where reproductive rights are protected and others where they're not. I'm wondering in the future will athletes choose to go to a school based on uh, the access to abortion? 
And to me, that's a legitimate sports story. Like, you know, will can Penn State attract more people maybe because Pennsylvania is seen as a place where you can, you know, the abortion rights protected versus, I don't know, some other state. Um, but I do think that journalists can do a better job. I mean, you can't, you can't ignore politics these days. It bleeds, it seems, into everything. And I think a lot of athletes are taking a more proactive stand. And we saw that during the 2020 stuff with the Black Lives Matter, how many people like Patrick Mahomes are really spearheading that for athletes. And we hadn't seen that before. And so I don't think you should just, you know, obviously you're writing a game story at Penn State. You're not going to ask James Franklin for his opinion on politics. But, you know, off the field, these people have opinions and lives. And I think we should do a better job as journalists of kind of seeing these as whole, you know, well-rounded people who have political views no matter what they are. They could be, you know, views you may disagree with, but I think we should you know, kind of hear them out. Do you have advice for for young journalists who might feel some level of discomfort just talking about the subject of sexuality with somebody they don't know and, you know, they're an athlete and they're intimidating and, you know. What do you think, know, like, that they know is, uh, is LBG, uh, LGBTQ or? Yeah, I mean, just, just the, idea that you're you're about to talk to somebody about something deeply personal that's really part of their identity and that can feel uncomfortable to to the to the journalist what sort of okay, first question you asked me like you know what prompted you to say come out publicly mm -hmm. what was what was has it made you happier you just ask general questions then kind of get more specific i think people especially people who are ready to come out they kind of want to talk about why they did it mm -hmm because it's such a load off their shoulders. I mean, I've edited hundreds of coming out stories and it's universal just how comfortable it makes them feel. So I think as a journalist, I'm still of the line, there's almost no bad question unless you're not being a jerk about it. You know, like if you're just out of curiosity, I think you could ask, ask you know, questions that, that they can choose not to answer. And since you mentioned the coming out, can you tell the story of the coming out story that you feature in Outsports? And the, and the, and the over time. Um, years ago now, we used to write a lot of the coming out stories ourselves, and they had kind of the same tone. And so why don't we have the athletes write their own stories? And so since then, we've really, when we've reached out to people, people have reached out to us, and I tell them, it's in your voice, it's a lot more powerful. I'm an editor, I can edit it and make it better. And people feel so empowered by that. And it also, they're better stories because um, they're in their own voice. And one of my favorites was back this uh, high school soccer player in West Virginia uh, wrote about how he came out by dancing at the prom with the, high school, <laughs> the homecoming king in his school in, high, in West Virginia. And the story went viral. And it was like these pictures, these two guys, you know, adorable pictures in their prom thing. And he's now on the school board in the, in the district where he went to school. So. But him telling his story himself was way more powerful than me writing it. And like the pickleball player talks about how kind of weirdly COVID helped him find another career because he lived, moved from LA to Kansas City, had nothing to do when nobody had anything to do. And pickleball was the one sport that was a COVID sport, right? You were outdoors, you were six feet apart, you weren't really in contact. And now he's on a professional pickleball team. <coughs> so we just kind of help people to, to kind of talk uh, right as if they're telling a friend a story, and they really are powerful because they're all so different. But there's a common truth, thread, which is I came out, I'm a lot happier, and I wish I had done it earlier. And I think that's what I would, people like Carl Nassib understood is that visibility is important because there are more than one person who's gay in the NFL, but we don't know who they are publicly, but we have a name now with Carl, and visibility is the only way, because the media is not going to out an athlete. I mean, just even this day, they, no one's going to do it. They would, you know. And so for the most part, we have to rely on the athletes themselves. Now, we are finding with social media that more and more athletes are public-facing what seems to be a romantic relationship online. And as journalists at Outsports, we try to have to figure out, are they gay? Are they just friendly or whatever? And it takes some time. And we often have to contact the athletes themselves because we want to get an affirmation. So the two pro tennis players out there are kind of jerk-like from friends that were posing and kissing each other. <coughs> and people think, oh my god, they're a gay couple. It turns out they're screwing around. And so we didn't take the bait. We dug deep and basically said, well, these are two guys who think it's funny that pretend they're gay. And they took the pose down after our story, randomly. They were kind of embarrassed by it. But otherwise, you could have run and said, oh my god, there's two gay 
male tennis players in France. Well, they weren't. <coughs> like we, you have to do that extra layer, kind of confirming that it's, you know, it's legitimate. And in, during the Tokyo Olympics, there were 185 athletes who came out. And 100, we had our first list of 135, and we added 50 others. And the cool thing this time, we're hearing directly from athletes from the Olympic Village writing us saying, hey, I'm gayer than anybody. How come I'm not on your list? And, you know, we're getting that kind of feedback, which we never got before from athletes. People are now much more willing to stand up for themselves and say who they are. And that reflected in the Olympic coverage that we wound up with 50 more names than, than we began with because people simply said, I want to be on your list. Um, so and that's been one of the cool things about these coming out stories, that one leads to the other that leads to the other. Right. Questions? I'm curious here, that how many people here know someone who identifies as LGBTQ? And it's almost everybody, and probably X number of years ago, there would have been maybe 10%, 15%. I mean, it, and I think that's gone a long way to having people sort of simply say it's no big deal. Um, when do you think we'll get to the point as a country where you don't have to like write stories about people coming out, when it will just like be normal? In other words, Jim, I'm not even going to get pushed out of this. Exactly. Well, <laughs> the good question is, in a certain way, until the person declares it publicly, he can't identify with it, right? I mean, then, so with Carl, for example, maybe some teammates knew he was gay. But until Carl told the world, you couldn't identify. So I think it's going to be a while because, in a weird way, gay people have to come out. Like, that. there's still a coming out process. And so. I think it's, you know, I, I think it's going to be, what I do think will happen is people will make it less of a big deal. It'll be a less of a story than up in Carl will be like, oh, that's cool. And it'll just be one more data point in their life. So I think that's what I hope will happen. But there's still going to be a need for anyone who identifies as, in essence, a sexual minority to come out in some way. But I do think it's becoming more and more routine. And I think women's sports are kind of leading the way. I mean, you had Abby Wambach, you had Megan Rapino, and Sue Bird. And it's kind of like there's so many now that you kind of lose track of how many athletes there are on the, on the female side. So I'm hoping the men get to that point at some point where it's just not, like, who cares? Because I think most coaches just want to <coughs> and It's not a distraction. Carl proved it's not a distraction. You know, when money talks and money is about winning in the NFL, and if you can help a team win, I think most players are not going to care about it. And in any locker room, there's a lot of, disagreements over religion and background and so they're used to dealing with differences but they're also used to dealing as a collective and I think it will I don't think once of the secret the Raiders made the playoffs last year you know I think Carl did something to that team that kind of unified them in 2021 um, so yeah I do I do think there's still going to be a need but hopefully it won't be a big of a deal um, I have a question since you started with sports, uh, how else do you think the stories that you tell have changed beyond like coming out stories? Like the kind of stories you tell beyond that? I think, again, it's more these days, more politics, which I don't really like writing, but, you know, it's necessary. Um, it's more, sometimes just more about the sport itself. We'll cover like the Women's World Cup. We'll keep a tracker of how the women who are out do it. We had seen LGBTQ in the Olympics, and I think we finished ninth. So we like looked at everybody who was out and what how they did in their medal in, in their sport, and we had a bunch of gold medalists and silver medalists, and so that we sort of covered from that angle. We gave ourselves a name, Team LGBTQ, and we kept a, a, a daily tally of how they did. So that's the kind of stuff we do more. As long as we cover more of the sports themselves. Um, I'm gonna take a take a, a brief uh, detour. Can you tell us the Paterno story? <laughs> oh, the Paterno story? Um, well, I was a young reporter. I was working at Center Early Times, and I had the, I was the Belfont Bureau Chief, which was, I was a bureau of one. Um, and I used to have to go to the courthouse every day and go through every civil and criminal case that was filed in case it was anything newsworthy. So one day I stumbled across a case of, you know, Paterno v. Our Lady of Victory Church, which I don't even know if it's still around. It is. It is. And I read through it, and Joe Paterno's son had snuck in after hours on the trampoline and fell and broke his neck. Turned out to be, I mean, which one was it, David maybe? Whatever, it's still, still around. But, and so the Paterno family sued Our Lady of Victory for negligence. And so I said, wow, this is a really juicy story. So my editor said, you got to call Paterno for a comment. And I was like shaking my boots because he was like, he was God, right? He, Joe Paterno was God. So I called him, and he, he 
his name, numbers in the phone book. You still call, you can call Joe up, and I called him up, and I'm really nervous, and I explained what I wanted to, and I said, you know, you filed the suit, I'd like to get a comment. And he unleashed a, a series of, of curses that I wish I had it on tape. Today would have gone viral, because it was just like you, he looked every word in the book, he just cursed me up and down for about a minute, it was like, huh? And he said, how dare you call me at home, I, if you want to talk about football, and I said, but you filed the lawsuit, I just am doing my job, and he just cursed me out, and they, I said, what should I put in the story? He said, Mr. Paterno had no comment, uh, so from that moment on, I wasn't a big Joe Paterno fan, because I, I thought he was a phony, I thought he was a phony then after that, because he wasn't St. Joe, he was... Sailor Joe or something. <laughs> what else we got? Who else has a question? How many journalists here have ever written a story with a LGBTQ topic? Could you, uh, do you mind telling stories about it? Um, I don't remember the exact topic, but I, I certainly... Was it a sports story? Was it a news story or a future no, I mean, story? It was definitely a news story, not a sports story. Um, I've done a couple on the resources at Penn State, um, but I'm currently working on kind of like an investigative piece about how um, trans people are treated in Greek life and organizations here. Oh, that's a great story. I want to see that when it's done. <laughs> I know that one of the collegiate interns asked today about how they could do a better job covering the community. Is they just tell stories, tell their stories, and you know, don't just don't just tell stories during Pride Month. Tell them all year round because they're a part, active part of the community. Um, and so I do think the representation is still needed. Uh, that the center just now, and it's cool that people here feel that it's a cool place to be. You can be out at Penn State, and it seems to be fine. Although I want to read about this story about Greek life, but yeah. So I do think, uh, yeah, I do think that we need more journalists to tell stories of people, especially with, especially with this whole trans athletes thing. You, there are one, there are very few trans athletes to begin with, but, you know, at the high school and grade school level, it's, you know, it's a really serious issue that <coughs> these bans are happening, you know, just blanket bans, and we're not putting, in, we're not putting uh, people first. And I think we need to really talk about these people as human beings first, as opposed to being a symbol of something. Beyond beyond Carl Nassib, um, do you think there was a watershed moment that sort of changed the way people view gay athletes? I think it was a cumulative series of things like Johnny Weir coming out of the you know the Olympics, like just being so flamboyant um, that people start talking about Johnny Weir being a gay person even before Johnny Weir officially announced it, because Johnny was so out. I mean, it was impossible. He was never in, so it was like impossible <laughs> to out somebody who was never out, who was never in. Uh, I just think cumulatively, like the Michael Sam and the Jason Collins things in 2013, because you have you know, when you have Obama at the time of the president talking about gay athletes, that was a really big deal. And then with the women's soccer team, you know, the Sue Bird, Megan Rapino, or you know, Sue Bird, I'm sorry, Megan Rapino and Abby Wambach and everyone else on that team, and you know, they were so good and you just couldn't ignore their story. So I don't think there's been one pivot moment because they all kind of build upon themselves. I think the media is simply more comfortable writing about it, talking about it. They used to almost be afraid of writing about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and now it's kind of like, you know, with, with Carl, it was a very a celebratory thing when he came out. I think that was really fun. I said it would be a one-week story. It pretty much was. You know, it, yeah. it, at a certain point, there's nothing to say about Carl Nassif once you get the fact he's, he's gay. Okay, he didn't commit a crime or do anything illegal. He just... Tomorrow he'll still be gay. Exactly. So, um, so I do think that, but but Carl was sort of a bit, big one in the sense that it was the NFL. Right. right. Um, I, I I have to agree with you. Uh, the the showing of hands is interesting because um, I think if it was my generation, um, it would have been way fewer people would either would say that they knew somebody who was. Uh, LGBTQ, or or just simply wouldn't have known. Yeah. And you know the thing I always say to the, my classes is like the, your generation is pretty cool with just whoever you want to be. It's just like you know I don't care who you are, but you're just taking way too long at the salad bar. Can you keep yeah. Moving? You know that, that 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 sort of thing. So. Well, that's what I said when I mentioned living in Hamilton Hall that everyone on the floor knew we were gay. 
but they didn't care. And that was back in like the late 70s. They were just pissed off that we got to share a room together when they couldn't bring their girlfriends in, you know, so that was really funny. They're almost jealous of me at the time, which was very humorous. Yeah. So, what well, we just mentioned, we're here in the 70s and you're here now. How do you think like Penn State has changed the way we're welcoming towards LGBTQ students and staff and everything? <coughs> Well, I was at the new center at, at the hub. It was fantastic. I mean, it was so, it was so much more inviting than the old one. I thought it was more airy. Um, I think what you're doing, Penn State Pride, is great, um, and I think the universities really kind of take the lead. And then you know, everyone here is going to be the leaders of tomorrow, as they say. And if you go out there knowing a wide, diverse range of people, you're going to you're going to deal differently with people in your workplace, wherever your workplace is going to be. And so I think that's a good way to prepare people is by exposing them that there's going to be a lot of differences. You're not, not everyone in your workplace is going to be like yourself. Be a lot of people are going to be different. And so I think I kind of admire what Penn State's doing on that. And even having me here, John, I really admire you for kind of wanting me here in the first place. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, is, are there any particular stories that Outsports has done that you are particularly proud of? I, I know that's a tough question. So many of them. Um, put you on the spot. One is kind of fun is that Years ago, the NFL used to, well, they sell personalized jerseys. And it was a player for the uh, Patriots, last name was Gay, what was it? A defensive back, heard his first name. Not Willie Gay, anyway, his last name was Gay. And someone wanted to buy a jersey with Gay on the background. It was uh, his professor at LSU, he, take, he was a LSU student. And the NFL uh, website rejected it, said it was an offensive word. And so he contacted us. And so I said, that's weird. And so I tried the same thing. You could, then you could go on and like pick a jersey, put the name in, and try to submit it with some, do a little thumbnail. And it'll put through an X through anything with gay on it. So I said, that's like, you can't buy a jersey with the word gay on it? So then I put in gay Nazi, and that was acceptable. <laughs> and then I put in Bin Laden, and I put in Hitler. All these things wound up as being acceptable. I said, what is going on? So I contacted him and wrote a story about it that went viral. It turns out it was, they had a list, it inter someone, someone didn't hack the list, it was the way the, the code was written, anybody who knew how coding could see it visibly. It was a list of 1,100 words you could put on an NFL jersey. I mean, words I had no idea were curse words. It, people are really creative when they talk about sexual stuff, <laughs> unbelievable. But gay was one of them. And so what they do, if you try to put certain terms, it would pop up as an as offensive word. And two days after a story ran, they changed their policy. And because it was just absurd, and then someone sent me a picture, you know, with them with the word gay on the back of their jersey proudly pointing at us. That was a fun story, and that was that got us a lot of attention because it was just sort of a creative story to do. And my favorite was the gay Nazi, like that was acceptable for gay ones. So <laughs> and then recently just sort of I mean just it's like just hearing people say how important their coming out on the website was, it really really matters. I mean, you know, just and somebody like, so you guys changed my life. And you hear that, it's kind of like, really? Like, well, that meant that much? Yeah, I came out and I have an entirely different life now because of you and your website and the way you treated me. So, yeah. Questions? Yeah, just to go back a little bit, what were some of the differences when you were covering the Michael Sam coming out versus the Carl Nassib coming out? What was that like for the website? Oh, yeah, Sam was a lot more, I would say, controversial because he was a draft choice. He was like in the draft. And the big debate was how good was he, right? Is it what, and then he was, he was draft. I don't know if people remember, Michael Sam was picked. He was the defensive player of the year in the SEC, which is a pretty good <laughs> place to be the SEC, to be the defensive player of the SEC. And he was expected to go anywhere from the well, third round to the sixth. I mean, there were some people, who, you know, everyone has different opinions when it comes to um, draft choices. He wound up being seventh from last of the entire draft and it was becoming embarrassing for the NFL. And he was picked by the St. Louis Rams, who had a ton of players on the defensive line. They didn't really need a Michael Sam. And I've always believed that uh, Roger Goodell talked to the owners and said, you gotta take him. I just, I'm firmly convinced that, because it would have been embarrassing for him not to be picked. I have something to add. So I, I've, I've written about this thing. I got asked about it a lot when NASA came out. Um, so I looked back a decade. Um, Michael Sam was the uh, Defensive Player of the Year in the SEC. He was the co-defensive player of the year that season, which I, 
I have a suspicion that he was named co-defensive player of the year, so they can name a straight guy also <laughs> defensive yep. player of the year. Anyway, going back a decade, the average pick of the SEC defensive player, we're talking about the second best conference in America, <laughs> um, uh, had was chosen, that person who won that award was chosen ninth in the first round of ninth. He went and he 200 was, and he and yes. Yeah. That defies credulity. Yeah. It does. It defies credulity. Um, so, like, the word, the word was out. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think he was picked by St. Louis because they have seven, they have, you have, uh, I think it's seven picks, plus you get certain supplemental picks if you had guys who left your team the year before. Well, the, Card uh, the Rams had seven supplemental picks. So they had picks they can kind of throw away, so to speak. But I firmly believe that Sam was picked by the Ram as a because it would have been embarrassing for him to be not drafted. Uh, and then he he didn't wind up making the team, and I think that was a, I mean I think he simply wasn't good enough as it turned out. And I, I don't want to say anything about Michael Sam, uh, but I, I think he once he got into the team he was given a fair shake. But I think the pre-draft stuff was clearly and then people have talked about it anonymously like well he'll be a distraction he'll be this and that and it just. You know, whereas Carl Nassib, and part of it, Carl was already an established player, so no one could question if he was good enough because he was good enough to get a $25 million contract from the Raiders. And he had been in the league like six years. Um, and I think times have also changed. I think if a player, a draft choice came out, a guy came out now in the next two and a half weeks before the draft, I think he'd be, it'd be a story and people would kind of yawn, oh, that's nice. Be between those two events, the Supreme Court ruling on gay marriage occurred. And that was a watershed moment. Well, because the gay marriage thing said you are now equal in the eyes of the law, your your marriage is equal in the eye of the law, and that was a big deal for people just because it it it, it, it normalized things that had been sort of considered abnormal. And we saw it even in the sports world. I mean, I think Ezekiel Elliott had a tweet once that was somewhat homophobic, <coughs> but then when the gay marriage came out, oh my God, it's fantastic. So you know, something like his mind had been changed in the four-year period of a couple of tweets. So I think, you know, we're seeing that more. So yeah. That's a, that's a great question. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Um, I do want to take this moment and uh, just when I, uh, up top, I was, uh, I, um, I'm so used to Curly Center events that I forgot we have a, we have a co-sponsor tonight and it's the center uh, for uh, gender, sexuality, uh, diversity at Penn State. And um, uh, so we're happy to have them as our, our co-sponsor. Hey, you should all visit their thing. It's in the hub. It's fantastic. It's a great space. You're just going to kind of say hello as an ally. And did you get any stickers? I got a couple stickers. So yeah. So. <laughs> like the Curly Center. This, is, a lot of this is Pride Month on campus, right? Sir. I when did you jump into the sports side of writing? You said you started it, uh, as a Belfont. Uh, oh, yeah. It was a, it's kind of interesting. It just sort of, I got a job and uh, I was, someone offered me a sports editor job in California, so I just took it. But with the LA Times, it'd be mostly news. But without sports, it was just, I'm just a sports geek, so it was kind of like it was a natural, it was a natural fit to write about it. It's more fun to write about sports than it is about politics. Uh, just, it just more, you know. Uh, but although today I said it's a little more fraught with uh, things, but yeah. Who was the sports editor when you were at the CBA? Ron. Yeah, Ron. Yeah, Ron Breck. Who was not a big Joe fan. Joe Pa fan. Did, uh, off, you know, privately just couldn't stand it. Because Joe Pa treated the local press kind of with disdain. If CBS came in and they got red carpet rolled out for him, but the local guys were kind of just pissed away. But yeah. So I, I, I was in Belfont. I was in the Belfont County Courthouse. Year, like four years covering that thing. So when the whole Sandusky thing happened, I was like, oh my God, it's like flashback. Yeah. So. Interesting. Question? I don't know if you know who Cam Thomas is, but in a post game interview, he said, no homo. And I guess that's like. Wait, 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 so what's the last name again? Cam Thomas. Cam Thomas. For, for who? The Brooklyn Nets. Oh, yeah, we wrote about that, yeah. Yeah, how do you. I don't think. He got fined $25,000, yep. and I don't think anyone, like, I think everyone knew that he wasn't, like, a homophobe. Yeah. But how is that affecting, like, your writing now, and how is, how do you turn that into, like, a big-time story? 
Well, that guy, we just wrote a news story about that he's going to be fine because the NBA is pretty strict. If you say anything derogatory about not just LGBTQ people, but about women, or you're, it, you're getting fined. And so the no homo comment, which is, just, it, it's homophobic. I mean, he may not have meant it that way, but it just is. Uh, because some, someone said there was, we got, they picked up a couple players from a trade, and he said the guy, the guy dresses better than me, no homo. And it's like, you know, really, dude? And so, but I knew he'd be fine. He was fine 25K. Because they find uh, uh, who's the, the, the Nuggets center, the, re the really good guy for the Nuggets. Joke it? Yeah, he was fine 25,000, but the same thing about three years ago. So how do you go against these athletes sort of that are like, that sort of say these homophobic comments? We just kind of write about it. I don't assume that Cam Thomas is a homophobe. We simply say he said something homophobic. And so you write about it. I try to give them benefit of the doubt, especially if they issue a good apology. Uh, but I think it's a sign that you can't, there's certain things you used to be able to say you just can't say. <coughs> like last year we did a story on, there were 78 tweets, uh, a young gay basketball fan in Chicago who went through the Twitter account of every NBA player on the Twitter feed and discovered 78 homophobic tweets. Most of them were kind of old, and we just ran the list and put it in context saying these were happening a lot before they hit the NBA. We contacted some of them, and most of them took them down. I mean, Durant had a couple. Um, I remember this. Yeah, because it was like, you know, you kept them up even if they were 10 years old. And you, at the time, it shows the evolution of people. So I think you just have to kind of call it out like you see it, because certain language isn't acceptable anymore. Like, I think when Cam said it, everybody knew he's getting fined. Like, the NBA writers said he's going to get a fine, and no one even... That wasn't even a big story. Like, he got fined, it was mentioned, and everybody moved on. Whereas maybe when Kobe said it, God, 13 years ago, it was a much bigger story when Kobe went after the ref and said, you effing, effing ref, so. Uh, I, think, I think there's also a difference between going after the athlete and just writing about what he said. And that's an action. He, did, he said this. The, the league's going to do this. Yeah, well, was, we didn't go after him because I, you know, I don't know him at all. I don't know what's in his heart. In this case, he said something that I knew would trigger a fine from the NBA, and it did. So I think it's how you cover that. You know, like they're out there in public saying these things, and so you know, there's certain consequences if you say things that they're going to you know go the wrong way. Uh, but we're seeing a lot less of that. I mean, I think a story about two years ago. I said there were no homophobic incidents in Major League Baseball this year for the first time in years. And, Someone on Reddit thought it was the funniest thing. We got so much traffic from that just because it's like you're celebrated without doing anything like being an idiot. But uh, but I think that's not. Athletes are more aware of it. More and more athletes have friends and family members who are you know out and you know they care about them and they they you know so when when Michael Sam came out and and Carl there's so many big name players who simply say that I wish them well. This is great. And, um, a guy named Ryan O'Callaghan came out. He had played with the Chiefs and the Patriots, um, and you know Rogers, Aaron Rodgers played with him in Cal, and was like one of his biggest supporters when he came out. So we're seeing that more and more. Years ago, people would have been more comfortable saying. I mean, part of it, more, people were more comfortable saying anti-gay things 10, 15, 20 years ago, and thinking they'd get away with it because most people are straight. And now even straight people go, "You can't do that." So does that answer your question? Oh uh, yeah, I was just curious. Huh? I was just curious. Yeah. Oh no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. That sort of brings to mind something we talked about. We talked about a couple of years ago, which was um, at the time there was like I don't know where he is in his journey now, but there was a kid from who, who was going to the University of Arizona. He was a scholarship athlete. Yeah. He was a defensive back, and he he had come out in high school. And one of the things we had talked about was like there was sort of like at the at the league level, you know, there's one active player in football and one active player in basketball in this kind of yeah. and um, But at the lower levels, high school, college, you're seeing it more. Oh, it's continuing, continuing to see it more, and let's just talk about the obvious implications of that. There's a lot more kids in high school are just out, and it's not even a story. They're just out to their teammates and their friends, and everybody knows they identify however they identify with. And so the natural progression when they get to college, they don't even have to make a big announcement because they're out. And I think that the implications are, they said when I took that poll, as John said, years ago, there would have been a lot fewer hands. So now everybody knows somebody. And if you know somebody, it's hard to, hard to hate someone if you know them. Um, 
you know, you know them when you like them, and I think the same thing in sports. I mean, athletes are coming up in an era where people are just more out about everything. Look at, watch TV and see how many more LGBTQ characters are on TV than there ever used to be before. And we kind of, you know, when Ellen came out in the 90s, that was an enormous story. Now there's just character after character. No one kind of, in a good way, cares. So I do think the fact that, that we don't even write about as many high school kids coming out because it's not as newsworthy as it used to be. Okay, so how do you deal with like the backlash and hate on like more like controversial stories like trans athletes playing um, sports and like trying to create like a safe space for LGBTQ athletes? What about the trans the attacks on trans athletes? Just like kind of like more like controversial topics like that where yeah. Yeah. how do you deal with the hate coming out there? Well, it's actually kind of, what's kind of weird is that this stuff has happened in the last two years. Why all of a sudden are trans women scary to people? Or why all of a sudden are gay men called groomers again, or pedophiles? It's just really happening in the last couple of years. And I think a lot of it's politically driven because it's, it's seen as a vote getter in some cases. Um, and that's why I think the trans athletes, it's that we have just the understanding that they just want to participate. There's, contract, there, there, there's a legitimate discussion over what should be the for one, the, the rules and regulations on you know transitioning and hormone levels and all that stuff, and I'm not a biomedical expert, so I can't even get into that. But there's a difference between that and people simply wanting a blanket ban, which is happening. Nobody can participate if you're a trans woman in a, in, on a girl's team, as opposed to how can we carve out a way for them to participate that's fair to everyone. And there are a lot of people that want to find that, but the people that are winning today are people that are just a blanket ban. There's a blanket ban in uh, several states now, and a West Virginia one is on hold because of the U.S. Supreme Court. And the 12-year-old girl that was given permission to run, she's not a very good runner. She admits, I always finish last. So why would you say she's a threat to women's sports? Um, and even everyone's familiar with Leah Thomas, maybe, a swimmer from Penn. She didn't dominate swimming the way Katie Ledecky dominated swimming, and no one wanted to ban Katie Ledecky. And so and Leah participated under the rules of the NCAA that was set at the time. So she wasn't cheating, she was following the rules. So if you think she had an unfair advantage and you, could, and you have a good faith effort, you can change the rules to tweak that. But I think too much of it is that it's just, I think it's a reaction to the diversity of society. We're seeing it in the don't say gay laws in Florida. You know, just, it's almost a panic from, from maybe an older generation of seeing its, it, you know, its culture dominance kind of breaking and which is why they're going after cult was it diversity equity inclusion initiatives on for corporations you know did yeah. because corporations realize their customers and employees of the future are going to be a lot more diverse than they were 10 20 30 years ago so it's hard to write about sometimes because you really kind of you know you feel powerless on you just you can raise the issue but sometimes you can't do anything other than just kind of let people know what's going on and we have a lot of stories about that we can write so much about the myths about trans athletes, you want to do that, check out our coverage on that because we have a lot of great writing about myths. You know, here, here's a myth, here's the fact, and that kind of stuff. Like, the, I'm sorry, the Biden administration just issued rules on trans women, on trans athletes participating in sport on Thursday, and I have no idea if it's good or bad, but I've heard people say it's good, people say it's bad, people say it's in the middle. So that remains to be seen. And that'll be the next big fight because that'll go to the Supreme Court. Right. Sorry. I think if you, you know, a lot of guys, especially men, talk about their coming out stories, their teammates are all just curious. They're curious about, you know, they're curious about some stuff that's really sexual, but they like being asked those questions. They think it's kind of cool. You know, like, who's the man? Like, who's the man? Who's the woman? And they're like, you know, it doesn't work that way, you idiot. But, like, they do it in a way where, like, the teammates love. And they, See, because we're gay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think that makes a big difference. If you feel comfortable asking even dumb questions of somebody, like, you probably ask dumb questions of some friends you don't know about, but, like, they, they love you nonetheless for that. You know, just like you're trying to educate yourself. So I think just listening and hearing people's stories, you know, I mean, gay guys in the locker room don't want to be treated. But they want to be screwed around with and, you know, horsed around with and joked with. They don't want to be somehow, oh, my God, I can't. I mean, you don't want to call them the F word. And that's what also is interesting is that a lot of players find teammates apologizing for language they used in the past. Like, I didn't really mean that when I, you know, said those things about. And, you know, people really, yeah, you weren't saying it about me specifically. And so I think people kind of wise up. 
And I think coaches play a huge role in this. Because if a coach is able to kind of set the tone, and some coaches do a great job, none of this can be tolerated. No racism, sexism, homophobia, nothing. Um, because there's no place in us winning. And that's why I thought, you know, James Franklin with the NASA stuff was terrific on it. You know, he's so supportive of it, and I think that's what we need to kind of break, and make it so like the point where it, I was asked like, when it'll be no big deal. Like, yeah, no big deal because oh yeah, three or four guys on my team identify gay, or I have five women or, or, or out on my team, and people just shrug because they're just, you know, the same as everybody else. We're uh, we're coming up on seven o'clock, and I want to uh, be respectful of your time for everybody who's who's here, and uh, let you enjoy the end of this lovely day. And uh, so, two last questions, and we'll thank the. Um, We'll thank everybody who, uh, who uh, helped us out here, uh, the Center for uh, uh, Gender, Sexuality, and Diversity, Curly Center, Rafa, and, uh, and, um, and you for coming all the way from uh, LA to visit with us. So two quick questions. One is, uh, Jen is a particular expert, but also give us your Super Bowl chant for this coming kind of season. Oh, God. I'm, a char I'm a Chargers fan, so I, all I know is I have a 30-0 lead and blow it in the playoffs. So, <laughs> uh, I, have, I mean, I think the a a AFC is so stacked. I mean, you can't go against Mahomes. I mean, so I, these days you flip a coin. I mean, every year it seems to be a different team. The Eagles have a good shot of going back, but I won't make a pick right now. So Okay. We'll, do, we'll come back to you. Yes. Um, and uh, advice for everybody who's we got a lot of seniors in the, in the room. Advice is, as people are entering, the, entering their, their post college life. Well, one, if you're looking for a job, just submit everywhere, look everywhere. Um, I know places are still hiring despite what you may hear about things. In general, I just think people should really read a lot more than they do just from diverse sources to kind of educate yourself on what's going on in the world. Just read people you may not normally read and try to find experts. Because I think if you're a well-rounded person, and you can journalistically, it really helps these days. And you all probably have skills, multimedia skills. That's big. The LA Times social media job is the one that we're hiring for because it's a real need for it. They call it audience engagement. And that's a skill itself, a skill how you put the right tweet out that people don't just read the tweet because they heard the story. So um, I just, just kind of be up to date on what the current trends are. Um, and that would be about the only advice I would have. Thank you very much. Let's give Jim a hand.